Hello. So we don't always present together, um, <laughs> although we often have. So um, last year, after much umming and ahhing and hand wringing and conversation amongst ourselves, we published on the double negative a strand of articles under the title Class is a Big Deal. The series set out to elucidate the problems faced by working class people when trying to access and sustain a career in the arts. We're very conscious of the fact that although this is something that has begun to be discussed, you very rarely hear directly from people who have first-hand experience of the issues um, and also the challenges, barriers and concerns that can loom so large. So some of those are the networks, opportunities, perceptions, self-image, time, confidence and money or the lack of those things. Um, before we had got to that point, a number of things had kind of occurred to me over the preceding few years and um, that meant I felt more comfortable to have the conversation outside of this quite small group of like-minded friends and peers. Um, these things, they didn't happen in isolation, but they kind of stick out as significant markers for me over the time. Um, one, of those, one of the things, and I think one of the reasons I included Tate in my bio this evening was because um, that's when these kind of ideas started to really coalesce for me. Although I'm not, I'm not a very young man, I kind of like, <laughs> I've kind of gone along throughout my career being conscious of being working class, but it's always been on the periphery of things. Um, but on my first day at Liverpool, where as um, Rebecca said, I worked until last year, a colleague that I'd never met before, a guy who works in front of house as a visitor assistant, um, he said to me uh, that it's nice to hear another Merseyside accent in the offices. Now, at first, I took this obviously as a friendly welcome, but um, after thinking about it for a little bit, I, you know, it was quite obvious that although it was friendly and, and intended as such, it was also kind of loaded. Um, you know, the inference was that I was just one of the few of the Merseyside accents that were in the offices, as opposed to the guys who worked on the desk or in the cafe or elsewhere in the building. Um, and then a few years ago, um, I saw a work by an artist collective called Common Culture. Um, that was in an exhibition at the Blue Coat in Liverpool, and it's from their series, Artist Tips. Um, so this is it here, but I'm, I'm going to read out the text because it's interesting because, for a start, one of my jobs was writing gallery interpretation text, and so they kind of frame it very much in that vibe, but this is the work in its entirety. So regional accents, which effectively means working class accents, can be problematic, but also quite attractive. If you have one, you already know the problems it can cause, but moving into the art world will heighten this even more. Middle class posh and upper class very posh, for whom privilege is the norm, populate and dominate the art world. They exude confidence, dress well, and tend to be louder and more domineering in conversation. They're also able to act as if they know each other, even if they have never met. <laughs> is this the, some of you are recognizing the, this statement? And you, Rebecca, it took a, little bit. <laughs> um, a lot of the best artists are working class. Now, this is this last sentence is really interesting to me. You do get working class curators with regional accents, but they tend to be in galleries attached to libraries. Now, this is the way in which we insinuate ourselves as working class people into the curatorial classes. Um, and when I shared this artwork and spoke to colleagues about this artwork, there was a clear divide in the people who kind of laughed with a knowing way, in a knowing way at that last sentence. And he just kind of laughed a little bit awkwardly and shrugged it off. Everyone knew what that last sentence meant. And it meant different things depending on your perspective, I guess. Um, and one of the last things really was that last year I interviewed the artist Larry Achampong for the double negative. Um, Larry is a, an artist whose career is, is very much on an upward trajectory at the moment and he's, he's just a thoroughly interesting guy and a great artist but you know I wanted to quite quote a little bit of what he said. Um, so in, the, in that interview on the realities of trying to succeed as a working class artist, um, Larry said that I can be frank, class is such a big deal and you'll, we'll hear more from Larry in a moment. Um, but it's, it's, you know, obviously this, this issue of class is, is, it fits into a kind of broader scheme of diversity in the arts and, and how that I think all institutions and especially the ones who understand they need real numbers through their doors are trying to diversify the audience because that's how they'll get different people and different bigger numbers through the doors. 
but I think quite often what happens is when they look around the table within those institutions, the diversity isn't, isn't really reflected in that. Um, so, you know, it was Larry's remark and, and that class is a big deal that kind of gave the title momentum for the series that we've run over the last 12 months or so on the double negative. Um, in my introductions to the series, class is a big deal. I started thinking about that um, Jarvis, Cocker co Jarvis Cocker quote. Harder to say than I thought it would be. <laughs> be careful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and it, in one way, it's kind of a really glib quote, but I think it, it, it fits in the, in the wider context of what we're talking about. Um, so she came, I'm, I'm going to not sing this, I'm sorry. <laughs> so she came from Greece, she had a thirst for knowledge. She studied sculpture at St. Mar Martin's College. That's where I caught her eye. So there's kind of signifiers of, of kind of like mobility there, um, not least in the fact that she ended up at St. Martin's. So writing on this quote, quote it, was, it was in a context of like um, this person's identity being revealed, but Barbara, Allen, Barbara Ellen writing in The Guardian in 2015, um, Common People is not a song about a spoiled, condescending female, however vivid the character. The song, part poem, part manifesto, is about Cocker back then, and people like Cocker as he had been. The long-term disenfranchised and permiskined who spend their lives feeling broke, scared and hopeless without a safety net. Crucially, it's a story about a penniless, working-class student rather than a rich, slumming one. In an increasingly polarised, one-note cultural landscape, this sort of distinction seems ever more important. I mean, that song itself was important for me back in like 95 when it came out. I was about 17, I think. So I was going out a lot and that was one of the songs that was getting played a lot. And it was the first time I'd really recognized my, my class being kind of referenced in a positive manner. And it was a kind of, it was a, a shout out and a manifesto for us and it was you know we could all sing along to the fact that we were common people we knew what it meant we knew where it was coming from and um, so it's fair to say working class issues were at that point feeling more pressing than ever um, we were planning a 2018 double negative fellowship um, which was for writers to be mentored by some really quite significant and um, famous ones I guess um, so central to our thinking was eligibility, like who should apply for it and who needs it most, um, who should gain access to this fellowship. We concluded that a fellowship should benefit those writers who, through no fault of their own, had hit an artificial metaphorical ceiling in their trajectory. In a nutshell, this boiled down to people whose access to key networks was limited, not by talent, ambition or endeavour, but by their immediate, often geographical circles. Ideally, the successful candidate would also, sorry, also wouldn't necessarily be able to recognise themselves in the current critical writing landscape. Um, we condense this further, calling for the discovery of daring new voices from the north of England. And this thing, this thing can fall in close parallel with, rather than being directly informed by uh, the findings published by Create London and Arts Emergency and their Panic Social Class, Taste and Inequalities in the Creative Industries Report. Which, which Dave opened um, this evening with. So the report looked in particular at the social class background of the workforce and how this intersects with other issues, including attitudes and values, experience of working for free, social networks and cultural tastes. The report found the percentage of people working in music, performing and visual arts with a working class background is just 18.2%. Fundamentally, this confirmed what any of us not granted a silver spoon or golden ticket confirmed by, sorry, conferred by privilege already knew, that things would have to change if, quotes, the idea of a fair and diverse industry, end quotes, could take hold and become a reality. So increasingly, questions of this nature are being posed and explored across the art spectrum. In 2016, Nick S. Shukla, the editor and author of The Good Immigrant, proposed via Twitter that someone should do a good immigrant style state of the nation book of essays by writers from working class backgrounds. And quick as a flash, uh, Liverpool based Dead Ink Books replied, we will publish the crap out of that. Um, which I think like, really harnessed the feeling um, in the room on, on Twitter that evening. So for that independent publisher, this, this instinctive response was like dropping um, a pebble into a lake. And those resultant ripples um, continue to be felt, I think, as readers discover the watershed collection of essays, which came to be Know Your Place. Um, more recently, writing about what he considers a crisis of the working classes in the film industry in um, Sight and Sound magazine, 
Journalist and film critic Danny Lee speaks of our living in a moment of gross inequality. He asked the question, what happens to working class talent in British cinema? Um, the answer, I think, it's safe to assume in that essay made for quite difficult reading. One of the contributing author, authors to Know Your Place, um, the, the book that was funded and published by Dead Ink Books, Dead Ink Books, Dead Ink Books um, Kit the Wall, who has become an increasingly vocal and powerful figure on this issue, um, thinks that the notion of social mobility is always smacked off. How can we help you to be more like us? It's, it seems to say that to be working class is to be a failure. Lee, meanwhile, recounts that his proposals for a project to celebrate working class figures in film to a room full of industry movers and shakers were met with amusement. So the consensus of the great and good was that any such spotlight was unnecessary. Um, but for Lee and DeWaal, amongst others, you know, they are at least starting to find traction and momentum in their respective fields. So the impact of these growing reports, publications and articles has been significant. And, you know, it's, it, it feels like it's just the tip of the iceberg. For many, it's led to an, an awakening of both consciousness and pride in the working class sta status. Of course, for some, this was never in question as proved crucial, along with perseverance, talent and perhaps anger to sticking around for long enough for a chance at success. It's, it's also a nuanced, at times fraught issue and conversations absolutely need to be developed. So it's great that these conversations are taking place, but I think you know, the more conversations that occur, we can start thinking about solutions and practical solutions as well. And the world of visual art, which, you know, I occupy, um, where the problems outlined in panic sorry, the panic study are deeply felt but rarely acknowledged. Um, this seems to yet to have truly found its voice. Um, I wrote this article um, quite a long way in advance of, of Rebecca talking about doing this evening, and I, I think it's really kind of encouraging and positive to start seeing things like this crop up more and more. Um, so, you know, as, as the visual arts finds its voice in this, in this area, I want to come back to Larry Achampong, um, who I was interviewing him about a new work. It had very little to do with, with class, I guess, um, from the outset or from the outside. Um, but we did get onto class quite quickly, um, and Achampong reminded us that even on the basic level of resources, the working class person is going to have to do crazy amounts of work simply to survive versus someone who has the privilege who can really just wait for an opportunity. People of privilege can use their connections. I don't think that kind of conversation is opened up. As a result, you tend to have conversations with people who don't think it's anything really to do with class. It's just how hard you work, which kind of echoes some of what Dave was saying earlier about the report and meritocracies. So, you know, after a breath, Excuse me, but this is bullshit. It's something I became aware of through study and along the way in these 10 years of hustling. How you survive gets pushed to one side, but it matters in a massive way. What does it mean for artists who can't hold down the multitudes of jobs? Just being able to see aspects of privilege that affords people time, comfort, care, safety, in comparison to those who are wondering how they will survive over the next month, or how can I make this money stretch or the project for the project and pay the rent? Naturally, those with privilege can be able to, will be able to last longer. They have the resources to continue. It's the haves and the have-nots. So I closed that article um, by really saying that um, the visual arts could do, do worse than look in the direction of and listen closely to what artists like Achen Pong have to say. You know, people who are enjoying increasingly popular exposure. So I'm going to hand over to Laura to, for the next, of the, the next <laughs> part of the presentation. As you can probably tell, we didn't time this very well because we're at 14 minutes now. <laughs> so I'm just going to um, conclude with a few readers' views, really. I suppose the class is a big deal series, has contributed to people uh, who continue to work, has been contributed to sorry, by people who continue to work in the arts and also our readers, first and foremost. It's really been a way for us to give permission without, without making that sound kind of very very grand. It's given permission to feel like they, they can talk about class issues. I think um, from, from some of the speakers tonight, I oh. completely lost the slides. And That's okay, Mike. <laughs> I'll beat you later. <laughs> I think um, it's, be, it's given pe people permission to have their own 
voice is heard in what can be a very difficult, complicated topic that can feel exhausting, boring and embarrassing to talk about. So Mike and I are both from different backgrounds, but we're both from very low income backgrounds. I'm actually from Anfield in Liverpool. Um, so I can really relate to the, the things that Rebecca was saying about the exhausting limbo of regeneration because that area has really gone through that. And you feel like if you talk about class issues, you're just kind of banging on a drum and, and feel like you've got a chip on, the sh on, on your shoulder, actually. And somebody did tell us that uh, when we, we asked a peer for advice on starting this series on the double negative and just kind of giving people a platform to talk about class issues. That person, that peer, who's an arts professional, just told us we had a chip on our shoulder and we should kind of move on. So it's really important for us that we just keep on talking about it and we keep on listening to people. We've had a lot of responses. Some of those responses were private over email and social media because they didn't still want to share publicly uh, their experiences of being working class. I'm going to just share um, a couple of exchanges here that were posted on social media um, that are already made public on our Facebook page but I think they have um I don't know I think they just show what a, a, a deep effect class issues can have on you when when they're internalized as or as has already been kind of touched upon I noticed in my teens that the only people with my accent at the gallery that I was involved with in their young people education program were the installation team technicians I remember asking them about their jobs and them saying, oh well, we only get to work here about every eight weeks. And thinking that didn't seem enough as a teenager trying to make life work decisions. Also, as always, identifying as working class from childhood. But then I went to uni, getting a gallery job. Then one day, while discussing class with someone, they'd say, you're middle class, you work in an art gallery, you and everyone who works there are by definition definition middle class I can relate to the comments about not feeling working class or middle class is there a distinction another person said between working class and skint it is so fuzzy I grew up mainly in a council flat with a first generation immigrant single mother lots of asbo style family problems <laughs> I grew up with books I grew up with ideas and expectation to do well my accent is more middle than working class. Always skint, cockroaches, cold beans, new stuff may have been stolen. We moved around a lot, so no fixed community to identify with. Never comfortable with any class, or is that just other people? Never accepted in either fold either. I did a first year of uni as a teenager more recently topped it up with some self-financed open university. What class would you put me in? I think we'll finish there. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>